How can a country whose leader won the Nobel Prize for Peace be committing genocide in its own land? A United Nations report showed that Myanmar's military engaged in mass killings and gang rapes of Muslim Rohingya with genocidal intent. The UN General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, stated that the report showed patterns of gross human rights violations and abuses committed by the security forces, which undoubtedly amount to the gravest crimes under international law. Meanwhile, despite the critical humanitarian issues regarding her country's persecuted Rohingya Muslim minority, Myanmar's Nobel Peace Prize winning leader Aung San Suu Kyi resorted to literature in her first public appearance after the damning report by the United Nations claiming that genocide had occurred in the country under her watch. In her speech, she discussed poetry instead of responding to the UN report on shocking human rights violations against the Rohingya, mass killings and gang rapes. And all the while, the persecution continues. Myanmar's armed forces and Buddhist mobs have waged a campaign of terror against Muslim families living in Rakhina, killing them, burning down their homes and forcing hundreds of thousands to flee. Many have settled in camps in neighbouring Bangladesh. Others survive in a no-man's land between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Why has so little been done to help the persecuted Rohingya people? And should the leader of a country involved in such violence have her Nobel Peace Prize revoked? Simple questions with important answers. But let's start with this. Does the public outside Myanmar even know that apparently more than 20,000 Rohingyas were killed in Myanmar? And if so, what thoughts do they have about it? We asked them. Here's what they said. Again, I mean, what are even the motives and why are we support, like, why, what is the world stage saying about that? Is, do we have any contribution to that? Do we, to the Western or Eastern countries who have any kind of power? I don't really know what to feel. Any sort of human suffering of that scale and caused by those reasons, I think, is just dreadful. She's partly responsible, at least greatly, she's probably greatly responsible for a lot of the, uh, the horrible things that have been going on there. And those people should be protected, not only because they're Muslim or because of their religion, but simply because they have a right to exist. It looks absolutely horrific, and I get the impression that nobody really cares, actually, if I'm being honest. I think it's appalling, man, because the cause that they're getting killed for is barbaric. They're like animals. It's just for them being human and what they believe in. I didn't know the number was that big. I knew it was definitely in the thousands, and... Yeah, it's really heartbreaking actually to hear the number is as high as that and I'm surprised it's got to that level and there's not been more intervention, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, it's really sad to hear. Officially record we got, but uh, actual figures should be um, hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands more. It is a latest genocide uh, in this uh, modern world history. I am, I'm devastated. I'm absolutely devastated. And the fact that no one is brought it to anybody's awareness is just heartbreaking, it really is. Well, the crisis in Myanmar is a manifold civil war, along with the crisis in occupied Palestine and in Indian-occupied Kashmir. It's one of the three longest-running conflicts on the planet, beginning in 1948. The current crisis that we've seen in Rakhine State is just one of the more modern developments of a long and multi-sided conflict whose overall trajectory doesn't seem to be indicating an end in sight. Of course, there's no doubt that the thousands of people have suffered and the Muslim community in Rakhine, the Rohingya, have suffered a, an extraordinary amount of violence uh, from domestic strife. So this is something that of course the world ought to be acknowledging and working to solve in the most constructive way possible, but given the fact that the conflict in Myanmar has raged since 1948, it shows that there hasn't been enough momentum behind various pre peace processes as there ought to be or have been. The 20,000 that have been killed is in the re recent uh, violence against the Rohingya um, led by the Burmese uh, military. Um, we've been as an organisation working f with the Rohingya community, for the Rohingya community for the last decade or so. So we're well versed with um, you know, kind of the atrocities that happen um, you know, over, over those years. 
So in 2017, August 2017, the latest violence, you know, 20,000 people were massacred, but more than that, you know, 800,000 people were forced to flee across the border into Bangladesh. Um, additionally, there was uh, in the region of about 20,000 rapes as well against Rohingya women. Uh, this is not the first time that, that Burma has done this. You know, over the past four decades, uh, there's been wave after wave after wave. So in 1978, there was a massive exodus. Again, in 1991, 1992, and then most recently, 2012, where 250,000 people were put into IDP camps, internally displaced people's camps. And then obviously, most recently now, um, from, from August of last year. Um, and it, there's actually no sign of any let up. I mean, we received information just a few days ago that there's another two or 300 people waiting to cross the border into Bangladesh as well. Across three years, Myanmar's military plus Buddhist mobs have run a campaign of terror against Muslim families, killing them, burning down their houses and forcing hundreds of thousands to escape. But little has been done to help them. How does the public in Britain feel about this? I look at the pain and anguish and historical difficulties that have kind of happened on the political world stage on a one-to-one -one basis when it comes to religious persecution. Again, unpopular opinion. It makes me sad that that's the reason why it's happening, especially if religion is what is contributing to this political agenda. So like there's this military that is acting on a religious sect. I feel like we live in quite a cocoon over here in the West um, and it's, you know, out of sight, out of mind a lot of the time, sadly. Uh, well, that's why we have the United Nations and the International Court to bring people who've done and committed crimes, if that's what it is they have committed, uh, to justice. I mean, it's very hard to understand why governments um, don't speak out and uh, maybe the people aren't making enough noise about it to try and ensure that, that governments speak out where they can and help the victims of a horrible, brutal genocide. We shouldn't allow it to happen in the world these days and again I get the impression that nobody seems to really care. I think when it's, when it's someone that's against Muslims as a general, the media doesn't promote it. It's not put out there. It's not wide, widespread. But if it was someone, say, if it was anti-Semitic, then it's worldwide. Then America's getting involved, UN's getting involved, everyone's getting involved. But where is someone, a group of people attacking Muslims, no one really cares. I think it's a combination of lack of reporting, there's lack of awareness um, and people not, probably not caring as much about ethnic minorities as we should do, whereas they might have cared more if it was happening in a Western country, for example. I think the international community, there is a, they're conspiring their interest. Wherever they have the resource and their interest, uh, they are pursuing their information on the basis on their news media, pursuing the information basis on that. It's not for Myanmar people or Myanmar government. It, it is the local politics is involved. That's why it's not solved. They, they don't even show it on the mainstream media. It just stays through uh, all other outlets, but not the mainstream media. Well, the problem is because nobody is actually on the ground. And that's why I don't personally associate myself with any statistics or any particular allegations. Is the violence being committed? Yes, absolutely. Are the Muslim Rohingya victims of this violence? Absolutely. But can we point the blame on any single entity? Not really, because sources that one would consider objective or neutral haven't yet been on the ground. In fact, very few, if any, outside sources have been there. Now, the thinking in terms of what the government thought was as follows. If Syria just let in anyone they wanted, then the war on terror that's going on there would have been amplified 100-fold. But what Syria did do is compromise and let certain vetted journalists with an independent mind in. In hindsight, the government in Myanmar should have done that. Um, Syria made the right choice in that decision, but at least now, perhaps, this could hopefully change in the right direction. I mean, the whole situation uh, in northern Rakhine state or Arakan state um, has been bad for a number of years. Um, so the Burmese paramilitary military forces alongside um, some of the Rakhine villages, Buddhist mobs, um, have been attacking Rohingya villages for a number of years. Um, in the last three years specifically, or in the last five years I would say specifically, there's been a massive rise of anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, the rise of the far right on, on, from a Buddhist, you know, na national and religious uh, perspective as well. Um, but but it's really important to understand that the, the people who have been suffering are not just uh, the, the Rohingya Muslims, but there's also been the Hindu, Hindu community who have also suffered, and and actually even the Rakhine community as a result of the fallout, they also too suffer. It's one of the poorest areas of Burma. 
but you know, without doubt, it is the Rohingya community who have faced the, the most um, kind of violence um, from, from the Burmese military. But also in other parts of Burma, the Kachin community, who are Christian, have also faced an ethnic cleansing as well. Um, and that's somewhat underreported as well. Some say that Myanmar's Prime Minister, Aung San Suu Kyi, should lose her Nobel Peace Prize for not actively trying to stop the violence against Muslims. Does the public agree? And why? She's actually been advocating for peace decades and decades and decades. Um, I don't know about having it revoked because you, you're given it for an action that you've taken. Um, we need to understand why this is why she's not acting. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, people get impeached of their MBEs, I believe, and they get those stripped away. So uh, I feel like you can cut the red tape here and, and definitely get rid of those, yeah. Well, we find it difficult in the United Kingdom to revoke honours for people who've transgressed. I think um, internationally that would be difficult. And at the moment, she's done apparently nothing wrong. Yes, absolutely, it should. Um, so it's not right for her to be considered a, someone who is peaceful and who is a purveyor of democracy and a solution when she's actually been a huge part of the problem there. I think she should absolutely 100% have it revoked. Um, I understand that she's probably in a difficult, delicate position, but she shouldn't be a world leader, a leader of a country and be prepared to stand back and see that happen in our country and not do anything about it. She's, it's, it's an, she's an animal. How do you sleep at night knowing your own people are being slaughtered? They're dying. I think it is a bit of a contradiction that she has one of those prior. I understand why she had it, but I believe that there's only been one other case where someone has been stripped of it. And so I think it's possible and I think it should be done. All the way, it should to return back her and uh, she should to be asked for that. Any, any persons died, not only hundreds and thousands, because she has to take the responsibility. I think it is a, it is a right and, and, and legal appeal uh, to the prosecutor because uh, she is running uh, the Myanmar government. But uh, that time, the people of the Rohingyas people, they are prosecuted and they are killed. The, because of, uh, she got a peace prize, but there is no peace in Myanmar. Yeah. And every time you hear about these things, these stories about the Muslims, the Muslims, you know, but when it turns around, and one Muslim does one thing, it, it just, they blow it out. But when, when it comes to hundreds and thousands of Muslims being butchered, nothing is being done about it. And us as Muslims, it really breaks our heart. It really does. <laughs> Well, first of all, she's the state councillor and her role isn't really commensurate with what we would consider a prime minister, whether the Indian or Pakistani or Bangladeshi prime ministers. Um, what she is is a kind of figurehead based more on her lineage, uh, her father obviously being a heroic figure, than any actual accomplishment that she has. She's clearly out, out of her depth in terms of statecraft, but the real power still does largely lie with the Tatmadaw, the military leadership of the country. So while the West built her up as a figurehead in 2011 when, and, and around that time when they wanted to prize the country out of China's economic orbit, now that no great Western influx of money has happened into Myanmar and they've pivoted back economically to China, her figurehead status is that much more clear. Well, the Nobel Peace Prize have already said, you know, the, the committee that, that award that, that prize have already said that they are not going to strip Suu Kyi of that peace prize. Um, which I think is a shame because I think that's a real show um, of solidarity with uh, a community that's facing genocide. Um, I also think it's, it's, a, it's a terrible shame because, you know, someone who has been given a, an award of such prestige really should be acting um, in favour of human rights um, wherever it might take place. And especially so when it happens in, in her own country. The UN report has said uh, that the fact-finding mission that was released earlier this week has said that not only are the Burmese military responsible um, for the atrocities committed, the genocidal intent, as they say, but also uh, the state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, for basically allowing this to happen and, and almost by covering up uh, the, the Burmese military's actions. Um, you know, as you said, you know, the, the, the peace prize should be removed. A number of cities across the world, you know, including uh, Edinburgh last week, I believe, have removed the freedom of the city and which was awarded to, to, to Suu Kyi. London has yet to do that, so we're awaiting that as well. According to Human Rights Watch, 
at least 288 Rohingya villages have been partially or completely destroyed. Before the crisis, the Rohingya population of Myanmar was 1.2 million people. But, according to Amnesty International, over 800,000 Rohingya have been driven into neighboring Bangladesh since August 2017 by the army crackdown. 60% of those refugees are children. In a recent speech, the Myanmar Prime Minister discussed poetry and literature instead of responding to the UN report published a day earlier revealing human rights violations. What does the public feel about this? Maybe being drawn into a conversation about that wasn't part of her plan, but she wasn't re prepared to comment on that. I don't really have any thoughts about that. This is a complicated question that needs, I think, some you know, considered response, and perhaps an off-the-cuff response isn't appropriate, so um, I'll let the Prime Minister get on with her job. She should have paid attention to something that's much more important, which is how brutally people have been treated in her country. She shouldn't have agreed to do that. I think it's a disgrace. It's, it's politics, isn't it? It's where she knows she's guilty. Like, if you've caught me stealing something, I'm going to try to talk about everything else apart from stealing. That's why she's talking about poetry, stuff that's irrelevant. She probably doesn't know poetry herself. She just got told to come there, do something and crack on. She's not going to speak about what the actual problem is. No one ever does. By not drawing attention to it, she can get away with the crimes more so, I think. That is the negligency and uh, racistic uh, mentality she's bearing inside uh, on her own, uh, which she's not to want to cover. She knows that, what happens. She's scared with the army. That's why she do, don't speak about, come out to speak in Myanmar issues. Yeah. When it comes to the Muslims, it, be, it becomes poetry, it becomes poems, <laughs> while people are being butchered. But when certain other people, uh, five or ten people, which again will be unfortunate, it, it turns out to be a big, uh, it, it hits all the headlines. Because it's probably being discussed by senior diplomats and by military officials, um, I, I'm not suggesting that she's unable to answer a question about this directly, but I doubt that she's in a position to do so. Her role is best understood as of that as a monarch in the Western European states that still have monarchies, uh, Holland, England, uh, Sweden, etc. They're prominent figures and they engage in various social activities, but they can't speak about politics without a script. I think Aung San Suu Kyi's role today is something sort of akin to that? I don't think it's anything surprising. It's not something which is uh, inconsistent with how she's behaved before. Um, I, I, I remember uh, this time last year she was in Singapore and she laughed when someone asked what's, what's going on in Rakhine State. So someone who can laugh in the face of a genocide um, to discuss you know, literature and poetry um, in the face, in, you know, in, in front of a, a, a report which says that you know, her army and her country has committed a genocide with intent does not surprise me at all. Um, in fact, a day earlier, uh, I think it was on the Sunday or the Monday of last week, um, she actually said about the Burmese military that the, the generals who serve in her cabinet are rather sweet. Um, and I think that shows the level of complicitness that she has with the army. I mean, she and the army are acting in consort. You know, they're acting together um, and, and it's incorrect to separate her from the army and her from the genocide. She is as responsible as the commander-in-chief who's calling the shots on how and where to fire the bullets. What should be done to stop the violence in Myanmar and ensure the refugees can return home? We asked the public. They're not looking to do things to help people. They're doing things to help themselves and to put themselves into power. So. Until you remove that kind of human flaw, <laughs> it's not much that can be done. No, I don't think so. We, we do a lot of intervening, as it is. Um, you know, why are we always the world police? Why are us in America always going and helping out and doing, the, doing all the fighting and imposing our democracy on other cultures? I think the word intervene is quite interesting. Um, that's why we have the United Nations. And I think if we believe in the United Nations and the Security Council and the work they do, there, is a, there are mechanisms and methodologies to deal with um, difficult states. Programs like this, you need to make noise about it. You need to speak up about it. Um, things don't change easily in this world, especially things like this that are so heinous and so horrible. But people need to be made more aware of it. They need to watch the news. They need to react to the news in a way and, and get people to care about this. Ideally, stop these things from happening.
you know, people getting raped and killed shouldn't, we shouldn't allow that to happen in a world these days. It's a sad state of affairs that's probably going to keep happening until this woman either dies or gets taken down from power, which I don't think is going to happen because for the West world, for the Americans, they're looking at it as we've got someone in power who's what, on our same methodology. I think that all the global political leaders need to get together and speak with the UN, speak with her and enforce it perhaps because the fact that they don't care, I mean, we can't do anything really, it's up to the leaders in the world. All we can do is protest and bring about awareness but ultimately the people in charge are the leaders of the world and they need to get together and really do something about it. After the second war, uh, world war, the five powers in the big powers is uh, they never been there together to dominate the world. So uh, we need the new world order to solve the problems. If uh, people uh, unite and politicians they can unite, uh, they can resolve the problem and, and it's not happened uh, in other time to the genocide in anywhere in, anywhere in, the, in the world. Awareness. Awareness plays a big part, it really does. The key thing to avoid is a localized disaster becoming another US excuse for regime change. While the United States has killed more Muslims in the 21st century, Muslim civilians, I might add, than any other power, they very sacrilegiously and hypocritically wrap themselves in the Quran when they want to unseat a regime that is conducting business with one of its rivals, principally China. The solution, therefore, is for responsible officials in Myanmar to work with China and work with other neighbors, other regional powers to get genuine, not soldiers, but peacekeeping officials there. I think there should be some Chinese peacekeepers. There should be some Indian peacekeepers because after all, India's arrival of China, a friend to America, but both China and India on good terms with Myanmar. The, it's essential for a country with an Islamic majority population to send peacekeepers. Pakistan, for example, Turkey, whose president has spoken a lot about it. Iran, there's a possibility there too. So there needs to be a genuine multilateral peacekeeping force sent to Rakhine State sooner rather than later. This way, people's lives can be saved and the US won't come in to do what they do best. Well, there's been a number of commissions, a number of reports which have come up with a number of recommendations, such as the Burmese um, uh, government should uh, ensure that citizenship is given, the Burmese military needs to back down on this unnecessary amount of violence, etc., uh, etc. Et but time and time and time again, it's quite clear that Burma as a country, as it is right now, is incapable of dealing um, or, or being able to resolve the situation that's, that's existed. The UN fact-finding mission report suggests that there should be an, uh, a referral by the United Nations Security Council to the International Criminal Court. Um, that hasn't happened yet and it's unlikely to happen because China and Russia will veto um, as permanent uh, members of, the, of that Security Council. Um, really what needs to happen um, is, is obviously for the Rohingya people to return back to their homeland in a protected manner um, where they're not going to be facing this violence again with full rights, with you know, unfettered access to journalists and humanitarian organizations as well. And for that to all happen realistically, um, and I know this might be a little bit left field, there needs to be a total regime change in Burma because while Aung San Suu Kyi is the state councillor, while you know, the, the military is still calling the shots in terms of all of the major decisions, um, you know, there is not going to be a let up of violence. And it's just going to, as I've mentioned before, it'll just shift from one community to another. So the Rohingya community are facing the, 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 the pressure at the moment, but we also know that the Kachin, Karen, the Chin communities, the Shan communities of Burma, all ethnic minorities have in the past faced these types of problems from, from the Burmese government. So really, honestly and truly, there needs to be a total regime change. Whether that's going to happen or not, I highly doubt it, because there's too much money and there's too much investment from foreign uh, companies and countries in Burma for that to happen. But we can, we can just wait and see. The United Nations claims it has evidence of genocide and crimes against humanity perpetrated on a massive scale. It has called for the prosecution of Myanmar's army chiefs and other top military commanders for genocide against the country's Rohingya Muslim minority, adding that international cooperation would be critical to ensure that accountability mechanisms are credible, transparent, impartial, independent and comply with Myanmar's obligations under international law. 
Myanmar officials have blatantly rejected the findings of the United Nations investigation. They deny the claims and refuse to accept responsibility for any of the suffering. And even as these accusations are made, the head of state, Aung San Suu Kyi, made a speech not about persecution, but about poetry. This has led critics to suggest that the removal of her Nobel Peace Prize could be the only poetic justice that matters.